So just a little bit about me. Right now I'm serving as the Wall, uh, Wall Kill Watershed Ambassador for the Watershed Ambassador Program. We're an AmeriCorps program. It was founded in the year 2000. Uh, our main goal is to promote watershed stewardship. And we, can, we do this through um, doing educational presentations like this one or um, community involvement. We'll do cleanups or uh, invasive species removal. And uh, we're also contracted through the DEP to monitor stream health throughout New Jersey. Now, so wetlands are an important part of New Jersey's ecosystem. And these are gonna consist of things like marshes, swamps, or really any saturated land, but it's gonna to have to fill three categories, uh, three requirements, which is um, plants grow in there, are going to have to be plants that do need the soil to be wet to grow in. Uh, the soil will need to be soggy, at least most of the time. And at least some of the time it needs to be covered in water. So by that definition, I'm pretty sure there are some potholes that count as wetlands, uh, but they provide a lot of benefit, um, not only to wildlife, but they act as natural filters for um, pollution and waste runoff. I think one estimate is that a 500 acre swamp down in North Carolina annually does $500,000 worth of waste management for free. But um, so with environments like these, they're gonna be full of wildlife and we're gonna jump right in. So pretty common, hopefully most of you know what a great blue heron is, but I've always liked them. They're the largest, uh, they're, the blue heron is the largest native heron in North America. There's only one or two species that are bigger than it. Um, herons are going to include egrets and bitterns too. Uh, they're going to appear, as you can see from the picture, they're going to appear blue uh, slaty, so blue gray from a distance. And when you catch them in flight, you'll see that their wings are uh, two-toned, either gray or white. They're going to, so you'll see them, they like to hang out on the edges of ponds, lakes, swamps, and they are hunting for small fish but really they'll go for anything that they think they can swallow and they find in the water. So frogs, uh, small mammals that they see on the shoreline, crayfish, crabs. I know that there are some reports of a blue heron getting a little too big for its britches and choking on things that it thought it could eat and it couldn't. Um, and it's, Hunting style is mostly wait quietly on the edge of a pond. And then if it sees something it wants to eat, it's going to stab at it with its beak. And from this, uh, you can see that herons have these sort of S-shaped necks. Uh, this will aid it in that sort of spear motion. The head is gonna come forward a lot faster than if it was swinging around with a straight neck. Um, the oldest, I think the oldest blue heron was found in Texas. It was over 25 years old. So not only are these birds pretty big, looking at like four and a half feet tall, they can also live pretty long. And they're going to breed from December to March. So that breeding season would have just finished up. Oh, excuse me for a sec. Um, but after they're done breeding, well, during the breeding season, they're going to form these colonies known as heronry. Hmm. I think that might be an error on my slide. Heronries. Uh, these can get pretty big. I don't know if there's any large ones in New Jersey, but uh, these can have up to 500 individuals. And 
So as like most birds, they'll like to nest at the top of trees. This is to prevent uh, ground-based predators such as skunks or yeah, skunks and maybe badgers from getting into those nests. But if trees aren't available, they will nest on the ground, but they'll also nest on uh, sagebrush. They'll nest on the top of cacti, uh, artificial platforms. They'll nest on top of beaver mounds or duck blinds. So yeah, so these, those eggs are gonna get laid between March and April. Uh, blue herons, I think, take about a year to grow up. Uh, I think they, they fledge about two months after they've uh, hatched. And then after that, they hang around the nesting area for another four or five months before fading, uh, fading out to find their own territories in the winter. So another member of the heron family that I like to talk about are green herons. So they're also pretty wide uh, widespread throughout the United States, um, but I, you don't see them as much as herons. They're a lot less, they're a lot smaller, so they're a lot less striking. Um, they've actually been observed using tools. They will use things like feathers or bread crusts or insects, and they'll drop them on the surface of water, of the water to lure fish to the top so that they can spear them. There is also, there's a kind of interesting sort of uh, debate going on about exactly how many green heron species there are. Uh, when you're, there's a, so there are three separate species of green heron that are collectively referred to green back herons. Or if you're talking about them individually, they are the green heron, the striated heron, and the Galapagos heron. Now, if you remember back to, if you remember a couple slides ago, uh, we were talking about that blue heron's S-shaped neck. Now it might not look like green herons have those, but we're going to watch just a little bit of this video and you might see something a little surprising. Ooh, gonna open up. Thought my computer is going to give up the ghost. All right, we're going to try just. Ooh. Technology, geez. Wow, okay, we're in. So we got this green heron. It appears to be looking for some prey. Uh, it might spot something. Oh. Ian, and we can't gonna... see the video. Oh, you're kidding me, really? Yeah, no. At all? No, we still see your uh, slideshow presentation. 
Okay, I've minimized my slideshow. What are we looking at now? You may need to unshare your screen and then share that screen. Oh, it does say my screen sharing is paused. All right, sorry about that. Yeah, there you go. All right, can you see the web browser? Oh, well, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, just and whoa, <laughs> uh, it gets me every time. Okay, well, that was a lot of work for that brief moment. Okay, uh, we're back on the slideshow on the presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, green herons are also a lot smaller than blue herons. They're only about a foot and a half tall. Uh, wingspan of about three feet, three and a half. Um, so blue winged teal is a species of dabbling duck that is native all throughout North America. I sort of chose it as a stand in for just the various types of ducks that are native in New Jersey, like mallards, buffleheads, northern shovelers. Uh, if it was the foot, like if I didn't want to cover a lot of different types of creature, type of wildlife, I could talk about, you could build an entire hour long presentation just on ducks. Um, same with amphibians as uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. So first formally described by Carl Linnaeus in 1766. Uh, I found that interesting. Uh, Carl Linnaeus was the one who came up with the binomial taxonomy that we use to identify animals today. So. The blue winged teal was one of the first, was part of the initial, I guess, group of species described. Then it's a dabbling duck, which means it's not going to be diving. It's going to be staying close to the surface and tipping in, tipping its head in to get at shallow uh, aquatic vegetation, trying to get some of the bugs off of it. Um, so you can tell a dabbling duck from a diving duck by the smaller feet. Uh, because they don't have to propel themselves downward. Although if you're close enough to measure a duck's feet, I mean, probably other ways to tell. Now, an interesting thing about blue winged teal, they nest way later. Well, they nest much later than most ducks. Uh, they in fact should just be starting to nest from mid-April to mid-May. So if you go down to a place like the uh, Wallkill Wildlife Preserve, yeah, I think that's what it's called out in Warren. No. Anyway, uh, you might start to see some of them nesting. Now, one of the major predators bluing teal are skunk species. So the striped or spotted skunk, about a third of nest failures for bluing teal are attributed to skunk species. Um, another big portion are crows and magpies. They like to get into the nests and eat the eggs. Now, red-winged blackbirds, uh, they're probably a more um, New Jersey representative bird that I could have chosen, but I just like these. Uh, one of the first birds I learned to identify because they're super easy to identify. Their call is super unique. Um, I'd play you, I'd play you a sound clip, but I'm not very technologically literate. So, um, but I'm sure if you live, if you live, if you've been anywhere near a wetland or swamp, I'm sure you've heard it. Uh, they 
are found outside of wetlands, but they will usually try to nest there during the breeding season. Um, they'll serve as pollinators because they eat various berries throughout the season. Well, not pollinators, seed spreaders. As because they'll eat blueberries and blackberries, cranberries as they come into season. Um, they can get pretty territorial. This bottom picture is a red-winged blackbird fighting off a mobbing an osprey, running it off of its territory. Uh, another reason why they're so easy to identify is that during the sort of territorial displays and mating displays. The red-winged blackbird males like to jump up to the tops of bushes and trees and stuff. So they're not only are they easy to find, they're easy to identify, they're easy to identify the call of. So a very nice beginning bird for amateur bird watchers. Um, except for one case, they are pretty similar to something called the tricolor blackbird. Uh, the main difference is if you look at this top photo, the red-winged blackbird has a yellow stripe. The tricolor blackbird is white, has a white stripe and a much more uh, redder shoulder patch. All right. So moving on to reptiles, I want to just talk for a few minutes about the wood turtle and bog turtle. They make up the two species in the genus Glyptomies. Uh, these pictures don't do really don't really give it a good sense of scale. But the wood turtle on the left is much bigger than bog turtles. They are about ten times the size. Full grown, a bog turtle is like the size of a playing card. Mm, yeah, maybe a little bit bigger. While wood turtles can get up to about a kilogram or I didn't write down how much that was in pounds, I'm sorry. Uh, but a kilo. So turtles are reptiles. They need to breathe air. So even though they do make their homes uh, in bogs or rivers or swamps, they are going to be coming up to the surface regularly. Now, you can usually identify, so the way to identify a wood turtle is on this left picture, you can see it's got these, this reddish orange coloring around its neck and legs. Uh, so that's a giveaway. And some of them will have a yellowish sort of stripe that follows their jawline, uh, comes up and around the jaw and down the other side. Um, Bog turtles are pretty easy to identify because uh, they're just so small. They are the, hmm. yeah. But identifying coloration is you're going to be looking for orange, uh, orangey, reddy, uh, reddish, reddish blotches on the behind the head, uh, back behind the eyes, but above their ear holes. So unfortunately, both are considered endangered in New Jersey. Uh, the bog turtle is also the New Jersey state turtle uh, reptile. So it'd be real sad if they stopped living, they stopped uh, existing in New Jersey. Now, one of the, the main reasons they're endangered is habitat destruction. Uh, turtles are slow. I, I'm sure everyone knows. Um, so as roads are getting built, uh, fragmenting up this wetland habitat, because they're so slow, it's a lot more dangerous for them as they're trying to get across it. But bog turtles are facing a even uh, an additional challenge with endangered plant, uh, invasive plant species like reed canary grass and purple loosestrife, because these plants as opposed to the native plants like to grow tall and really thick. And because the bog turtle is so small, it actually cannot push through them. And 
as it's limiting it's as the places it can go is getting limited that's limiting where it can find food finding mates which is uh not good for it now i wrote both native mostly to the eastern united states and i had to put mostly uh you can find wood turtles I, through Wisconsin and Michigan. But if you do wanna see these guys, you're gonna to have to get up pretty early. So they do spend a lot of their, they're both diurnal, so they're gonna be out during the day. But the time to see them usually uh, basking, which is when they hang out in the sun to raise their internal body temperature is gonna be early morning. Uh, so wood turtles are, will range and during the summer will actually go pretty far away from the water. Well, relative to their size, about a half a mile or a mile on their, as they're scavenging for various insects and the foods that they like to eat. And during the summer, during the hottest times of the day, they also just like the even though they are cold blooded and they need the sun to regulate their body temperature, if it gets too hot, they will uh, retreat into the woods or back underwater to cool off. But during the summer, uh, wood turtles spend almost no time in the water. Well, much less time in the water to the point where they're considered almost terrestrial. Uh, bog, turtles, uh, bog turtles stay a lot closer to the water. Uh, they rely on the mud of, they rely on the thick mud at the bottom of swamps and stuff to hide from predators. So they don't like to get too far away from that. But both turtles will, I already mentioned the Baskin stuff. Hmm. Let's see. So they like to hibernate throughout the winter, but both of them should be coming out around now. I know some of my uh, colleagues have started seeing things like snapping turtles. So it's getting to be turtle time. Yeah, wood turtles will come out about March, April. Um, bog turtles also come out in about that range, but it's more tied to temperature. To, I don't know if today was the first day. Well, yes, I don't know if yesterday was the first day it got over 60 where I am, but uh, sort of six, that 60 to 80, that uh, normal consistent, there we go, that consistent 60 to 80 degrees weather is when bog turtles are going to start coming out of hibernation. And because these, uh, because wood turtles are scavenging so far away from their home waters, they actually have developed this innate homing sense. Uh, scientists have experimented by Sounds a little mean when you say it out loud, but they'll take wood turtles and drop them a couple miles away from where they usually nest and watch, and they'll find their way back, usually no problem. All right, so moving on to amphibians. Uh, so reptile, uh, going back against the slide. So due to how reptiles sort of live and reproduce, uh, that scaly water resistant skin, as well as the hard shelled eggs. There's actually not a lot of reptiles outside of turtles that live in, or at least in New Jersey, that uh, spend a lot of time in wetlands. So we're moving on to amphibians. And once again, a lot of amphibians, pretty much all amphibians need wetlands to survive as their while the adult forms can survive for moderate periods of time outside of the water, they're young. They need to, uh, the young have a sort of larval water dependent form. So we got tadpoles for frogs and uh, larvae, I guess they're called for salamanders. But uh, the long tailed salamander uh, grows up to about six inches long. And, excuse me. Half of that is gonna, wait, well, two thirds of that actually is gonna be its tail. And you're gonna identify it by these. 
long sh black strut well these black irregular stripes that run down this length of his tail now kind of uniquely uh, these long-tailed salamanders like to live in areas near uh, with lots of limestone or where carbonate is somehow seeping into the water so they will be found they can be found in caves they can be they'll be found living in mines uh, old abandoned mines but when they're not hiding out they're mostly active just a few hours before after sunset or uh, especially if it's been rainy or if it's super humid but they'll spend the day hiding underground uh, like I said, hanging out near hanging out near streams, and their diet consists of mostly insects. So we're talking about things like beetles or beetle larvae, the ones that live in K, uh, mines. I believe have a diet that consists mostly of spiders. And they're, I don't know if they're social social, but they're not territorial. Maybe just because of how specific the living requirements that they enjoy are. So co if you can find one, you can probably find more. I think when I was researching them, there was a report that they found 300 of them in one mine, which seems like a lot. So here we have a picture of that larval form. Um, we got the legs starting to come in. And for salamanders, they have this neck ruff that hopefully you can see on this middle left one. And those are its gills, which will be absorbed in and it will start breathing through its skin. But yeah, they lay the eggs between January and February. Uh, the larval stage will last for about three to five months. Um, then they will reach adulthood and spend the rest of the summer, spend the summer hunting near the water. And then winter, by October, they'll have winter, they'll move to their wintering sites. So mines, caves, or if they can't find one of those, they'll uh, hide out in, underneath logs, uh, in leaf litter. So spring peepers, once again, maybe there was a more New Jersey representative one I could have picked, but these guys, uh, like if you can hear, one of the best ways to find, figure out if you're near a wetland, besides having your boots fill up with water is when you start hearing these guys. Um, but yeah, they're common throughout the US, Eastern US and Canada. And you will hear a bunch of them near any body of water during the night. Uh, they do their peeping call. Once, once again, I would have played you a clip. Of course, they're gonna eat insects. So things like beetles, flies. Now, New Jersey also has a lot of native uh, tree frog species. However, these are not one of them. They like to hang out in the low vegetation when they hunt. Uh, probably why they have that brown coloring is to better blend in with foliage. And they will mate from early spring till June. Although you're definitely going to hear them calling all throughout the summer. And yeah, just like uh, all other amphibians, they're, super, they're relying on wetlands for places to spawn their tadpoles. All right. So moving on, we're gonna talk about mammals for a while. I was actually surprised. I've never seen an otter in New Jersey, but oof. Uh, 
anyway. But I know they're apparently they're apparently around. They can be found in Sussex County. Uh, they're shy, so it's, it might take a while. They are members of the weasel family, um, Mustelidae. Uh, one of their defining one of the defining features of uh, the weasel family is they have very strong um, scent glands that they will use to mark their territory, uh, rub on stuff to communicate with each other. So they can weigh up to thirty pounds, reach three and a half feet long. Thirty pounds is like a cocker spaniel if you're a dog person, or two cats, if or about three cats if you're a cat person. And so despite the name river otters, they'll live, they can live basically near any body of water. Uh, they'll go in the ocean. And are found pretty much all throughout the United States and Canada. Not so much in New Mexico because, so there are 13 species of river otter. Um, the one we're looking at now is the North American river otter. Once you get down into Mexico, a different species becomes dominant. But other than deserts and the Arctic, you can find these at anywhere. Um, right now, they're considered a species of least concern. Um, they do suffer a little bit from habitat destruction, but they're not, they were once trapped pretty uh, pretty extensively for their pelts, but just a con uh, just a mix of factors. Uh, the availability of cheaper synthetic waterproof material, uh, just a moral shift about killing otters. Uh, so they haven't really been trapped regularly or on a wide large, big scale for a long time. So they've actually bounced back pretty well. So, as you can see, they got that long, thick tail, and that is actually, they do act, actually not use that to swim normally. They use their padded uh, web front and back paws. That long tail acts more like a rudder, provides stability, although they can't actually use it to put on a burst of speed. But fun fact, otters are not actually natural born swimmers. Uh, just like people, they need to be taught by their mothers. Uh, probably, I think it's about two months they, before they get introduced to the water. But after that, they need to, they're buoyant, but they need to get learned. They need to learn how to swim just like everyone else. And they are obligate carnivores. Uh, so that means they're going to be eating meat. They'll mostly go after fish, but they're pretty opportunistic. They'll eat bugs, snakes, lizards, frogs, uh, smaller mammals. Uh, and by smaller mammals, that includes small dogs. So while they, I know every, I know they have this very cute and cuddly uh, presentation, but if you do find one in the wild, it's best to keep away from it. Especially if you have a, you're out walking and I say, a, uh, I don't know, a pug or a chihuahua or something. Oh, that bottom right picture was taken by the Muscanet Kong River. So they are, they are native, they are around in Sussex County. Lost my place in the notes. All right. So yeah, so the family, the family unit um, is the basic unit in the otter society, not society, the fur otters. And that's going to consist of a single female and her pups. These pups are usually born between February and April. But so something kind of unique that North American otters do is they have females do have a thing called delayed implantation. So even though they, 
May, very like late winter. The, I guess the egg will sort of hang out for seven to eight months before it sort of uh, be actually gets fertilized and begins to gestate. So even though it really only takes two months for a full-term otter pregnancy, they'll hold on to that. They can hold on to that fertilized egg for almost a year and they'll sort of line that up to coincide with the end of winter. Now, while it is waiting to get birth, female otters are going to start looking for a burrow to sort of establish their own territory. But otters do not actually dig their own burrows. They're going to be relying on finding either uh, natural overhangs or they will take them from, they'll take burrows from uh, beaver, they'll take dens from beavers or foxes if they'll if they can find them they actually don't mind being situated just a bit they don't mind walking a bit to get to the water um there was a river otter on the property i was living on that i think its den was oof, 100 yards maybe 200 yards away from the waterfront so they don't mind walking Um, but yeah, so it takes about two years for otter pups to grow up and sort of leave. And while, so that's like, that's two rounds, I think that's about two rounds of, uh, mating season. So a family unit can, can get pretty, I guess can get fairly big, six or seven. And the, uh, the older, the yearlings will take care of the newborn pups. If a uh, mom needs a break, very rarely some of them will hang out, hang around for longer, but they usually move on. And uh, so female territories, they try not to overlap the female territories too much. So when a female otter is ready to leave the, leave the den, uh, sort of leave and find her own territory, she'll go, they'll travel pretty far distances. We're talking... 30 to 50 miles away from where they were born. Uh, guys, guys are too lazy to do that. They're only going to travel about 20 miles before uh, established, before uh, joining a territory. And uh, yeah, so lone males will just uh, sort of gather together and form groups of over a dozen. They'll live together, uh, den together. They'll hunt together. And they're, while they'll avoid... And while family groups will sort of avoid other otter families, the, the male groups will uh, just sort of, will just hang out. They'll have a larger territory that will might cover several females' territories. And that'll just help them out when it gets around a mating season. And so even though they're technically around, they don't usually help rearing, with the, uh, rearing the pups. Oh, I have a video. Okay, we're going to try this again. So here we got some adopted otter pups from the Oregon Zoo. Um, mostly I just wanted to show people some cute stuff. But so here we can see, well, we could see examples of otters using their paws to swim. We're also seeing examples of that sort of playful activity that otters are so well known for. These are actually... Um, this will actually, these are, this is actually training to help them hunt when they're in the water. And so really young otters actually do not exhibit play behavior that often. It usually doesn't show up until they're a couple months old and they're actually getting out into the water and it sort of becomes important for them to learn how to hunt for themselves.
Ah, cute stuff. So you want to know if there's otters living or present in a stream or a swamp or a marsh that you're going out and walking around. Um, so some ways that you can tell are on the left, we have an otter slide. They'll wear what they, they have very, when they find a spot of the bank that they like to come in and out of, they will usually stick to it. And this will create these slides that mark where they enter and exit water. Uh, beavers will use them too, so it's not an absolute giveaway. But um, if you start, if you do see several slides, it might bear, you know, keeping an eye on them. Maybe you'll get to see an otter. On the right, as I as I've said, otters don't actually dig their own burrows, but these are places that otters might like to den. Looks like a washed out tree. So those are good spots. Or if you just see holes dug into the side of the bank, like obviously something's living there. Maybe it's an otter. Oh, wait, sorry, one more thing. I didn't get a, I didn't get a picture of it because I couldn't find a good one that didn't wasn't just poop. Well, scat. But so otters like to make latrine sites where they'll uh, defecate. And they'll sort of use the same site. So if you start, so if you do see an area that has a lot of uh, droppings in it, uh, also fish scales or fish bones, um, then you might be looking at an otter latrine. Uh, these also sort of serve as meeting points. They'll, uh, this is where those scent glands come into play. They'll mark the territory around it and it'll sort of serve as a message board for the otter community. Now here's a picture of some otter tracks. And so the tracks on the left don't really look like the tracks on the right because you're, ne you're usually never gonna get conditions so good that you get the distinct pads. Um, but you're gonna be looking for five fingered toes, uh, five, uh, yeah, fingers, a five fingered paw, uh, not retractable claws. If you are lucky, otters do have webbed feet. So if that shows up on the uh, prints, then that's a good sign. Now, mustelids do actually have a unique way of moving, uh, especially if they're running. They, so what's seen here is their walking, uh, their walking pattern. But when they're running, they have a sort of spring forward and then drag their back half behind them sort of approach. Uh, you can see it in ferrets and weasels if you've ever seen a pet. If you've ever met someone with a pet ferret, that's how they're running around as they launch forward from their back legs and then use their front legs to pull their back legs after them. And it ends up creating this sort of parallel tr track of set of tracks that might make it easier to identify an otter. So beaver, beaver is actually, beaver is native in Northern New Jersey. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of seeing one, but again, some of my colleagues have been managing tree planting sites long-term and they've done such a good job that families of beavers have started to move in. And that's good because it, means that their watershed rehabilitation stuff is going well. But when you've spent 10 years looking after this group of trees, all of a sudden to find out that half of them have gotten chewed down, it's okay to be a little angry. Um, but they are the largest rodent in North America. They're the second largest rodent in the world, or well, maybe the third. So there's two species of beaver. There's the North American beaver and the European beaver. Um, the North American beaver has the greatest range of weight. 
So on average, they're about 60 pounds, but they continue, just like their teeth, uh, they continue growing throughout their whole lives. So in Wisconsin, an absolutely massive 110 pound beaver was caught and somehow I couldn't find a picture of it, which is disappointing for me. Um, but anyway, so they're the, on average, they're the second largest rodent in the world. The first is the capybara down in South America. Um, identified by its large flat tail and large front teeth. Now, they actually do use their front tail to swim, unlike the otter, and we'll talk about it later, the muskrat. And that's a good way to tell them apart because since they're using it to swim, uh, a beaver's tail is usually below water instead of on the surface. Um, you may have noticed this set of orange chompers on the screen. And that is a pair of, well, I guess a quad set of beaver teeth. And the reason that they are that orange cover, orange colors, they actually contain iron compounds to toughen them up and prevent them from cracking as they um, chew on tree, uh, cut down those, uh, well, gnaw down those trees. Yeah, chew through the hardwood, helps them chew through the hardwood. And amazingly enough, these are also self-sharpening. So this front, this sort of front side that we can see has the iron compounds, but the back side actually is composed of a more traditional dentine, sort of the stuff our teeth are made out of. Um, and it's gonna wear away a lot faster than metal. Well, not metal, but the toughened material and it is going to create that wedge shape that beavers will use to chew down trees. Um, so beavers eat more than just wood. They in fact don't actually eat that much wood. During the summer, they will generally eat leaves or the stems of water lilies. But they, during the summer, during the warmer months, their diet actually consists of mostly non-woody material, um, such as cattails, I already mentioned water lilies, and they'll eat the leaves, stems, sprouts, and roots. Um, during the winter, they will move over to that hardier uh, woody material that they've stored. And because it's wood, it'll last, it'll last longer. So they'll eat that throughout the winter. Um, obviously, you can't... Uh, can't talk about beavers without mentioning, mentioning the dams and the, the dams and bridge, uh, lodges. So beavers don't actually live in the dams that they create. They, they make separate homes called lodges. And these are going to be piled up mounds of mud, uh, sticks, branches. And they will mound that up until it's above water. And the inside is actually really sophisticated. Um, they're gonna have a, usually have a two chambered structure. That first chamber is for drying off so that they uh, don't get their living quarters wet. And then the second area will be where they sleep um, and store their food. But the main purpose of why they make these dams is, they cr is to create water, uh, create deep enough water that they can escape from predators. Um, as, let's see if I can just, as you can see, they're pretty stocky, not especially agile on the land, but they're pretty good at moving in the water. So they will do as much as they can to make that where they can spend most of the time, even if that means building a giant dam and blocking a river. Um, so early, earlier scientists believed that dam design was this intentional thing, uh, that beavers were super intelligent, these architectural geniuses. Um, that was put to the test when they played the sound of running water in a, because uh, 
beavers will actually um, move to repair dams if they hear the sounds of if they hear leaks. So they played they played this recording of running water just out out above ground and not near water, and beavers just sort of covered it and covered the uh, covered the transmitter and mud and sticks and that kind of put the kibosh on thinking of beavers as these advanced architectural geniuses. Um, so a thing that's less well known about beavers, or at least, um, yeah, I haven't heard a lot of people talking about it. Uh, they also dig canals. So on top of building dams, um, they'll actually dig out canals. That's what we're seeing on the right. Um, these things can get pretty long, stretching a couple, couple hundred yards up to like a half mile. And once again, this is just going back to beavers not being especially mobile on the land and just doing everything they can to um, put themselves in a better position for escaping from predators, as well as uh, making it easier for when they're transporting logs for the dam. And as you might guess, these dams actually do change the environment around them. Uh, they slow down the water flow, which limits erosion. Um, the standing water will create habitat for waterfowl, you know, geese, ducks, herons. Um, it might allow for the establishment of plants that grow in these kind of conditions. Um, so beavers will actually eventually create wetlands if left to their own devices. Um, I couldn't find a good picture of it, but the longest beaver dam is, it's like several thousand feet long. It's like half a mile long. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. It's up in Canada. So I got another video here and it's just a short one. Might not. Oh my God, what's happening? Okay. So this person has out walking the trail one morning and stumbles upon a beaver carrying a log. Now, yeah, they're, they're larger than you think they are. <laughs> uh, but that's just an example of them. Uh, doing that engineering thing, building that dam, or repairing the repairing the lodge. So, very cute picture of a juvenile beaver. A group of beavers is called a co colony. Um, beaver pairs are monogamous. They mate for life. They have one litter a year. And they are actually quite territorial. Um, so once beavers are grown up, they are encouraged to vacate the premises. But it does take multiple breeding seasons for, uh, just like otters. It'll take multiple breeding seasons for kits to reach their full maturity. So they, a, auto, a beaver family will consist of, a beaver colony will consist of the breeding pair, uh, their, new, their new batch of kits, and the kits that they had last year. Um, very rarely, a adult beaver yeah, well, a young, a newly adult beaver will stay and stick around for an extra year, very similar to otters in that sense. 
All right. So muskrats, um, they are a member of the rodent order, but they are a member of the family. Oof, I looked up how to pronounce this. Chrysisidae, um, which puts them closer to voles or lemmings. So despite the name, they are not directly related to rats. Um, and despite how they look, they are not that closely related to beavers either. Um, you can see that they have sort of the start. If you look at this bottom right picture, you can see that they have the start of that flattened tail thing going. Um, not quite as pronounced as a beaver. Uh, this is an example of something called convergent evolution where um, unrelated species uh, when put under the same environmental pressures will start to develop the same way. Um, so who knows, maybe in a couple million years, it'll be super hard to tell muskrats and beavers apart um, or muskrats will look like beavers and who knows what beavers will look like. Um, but right now it's still pretty easy to tell them apart as I was talking about earlier. Uh, if the tail is, if you can see the tail, it's probably muskrat. And it also helps that muskrats are not the largest rodent in North America. They are several times smaller than beavers. So that's going to usually be a good giveaway. And they are 90% herbivores. They like to eat cattails and other marsh plants, although um, nothing's stopping them from going, to a, uh, going after a little bug if they find one. They also mate for life, monogamous breeding pairs. Um, so I was mentioning that they're smaller than beavers. Uh, like I said before, beavers have, North American beavers average about 60 pounds. Uh, muskrats will average only about four or five. But one of the trends that you'll see for these aquatic mammals is for their size, they are relatively hefty. And that is just padding to protect them from the losing heat to the water. Um, they're much more active at night. As I said, they go out to feed on plants. Um, and this actually has sort of a beneficial effect. Um, so because they're smaller, they can get in among the cattails as they eat them, which sort of clears out the cattails, which lets beavers get to the banks, which lets beavers eat the trees. Um, it's a whole cycle. Uh, especially if and they also do contribute to also creating habitat for waterfowl by stopping the plants from growing too thick. Um, I think they're pretty cute. So it's sad for me to say that pretty much everything eats these. Uh, foxes, coyotes, raccoons, bears, eagles, snakes, owls, hawks, otters, turtles. Um, I guess if they find a young one, herons will go after them, bullfrogs. Um, large fish, people. Um, I've never experienced it, but apparently fried muskrat is quite the delicacy in South Jersey. Um, but despite all of that, they're doing fine as a species. They are rated a species of least concern because unlike some of these other species we've been talking about, they don't have a problem living near people. Um, they're resistant to pollution um, because of their herbivorous diet. They don't mind if things like frogs and insects die out, ones that are sensitive to pollution. Um, they don't mind living in canals because, um, yeah, that's, they don't have that uh, sort of landscape restructuring instinct that beavers have, so they're less likely to get trapped and shoot away. I did mention they mate for life. Uh, on the right, we've got a meerkat, nope, muskrat, muskrat kit. So family unit will consist of mated pair and offspring. Um, now this is where that sort of rodent, I'd, uh, rodent heritage comes in. So, cause they'll have up to two, they'll have two or three litters a year of up to six to eight um, kits. Although that does get focused around, they, uh, the most births do happen around May. 
and that'll take about a year for them to grow up and then they'll leave the parents. Um, muskrats are fiercely territorial. Uh, many of them, many, many of them die uh, fighting for territory or for mates. So, uh, you know, not as beavers aren't as bad, but a little bit like beavers, they once they're adults, the young are uh, no longer welcome on the parents' territory. And again, we just have some ways to identify if a muskrat is living in an area near you. I didn't put this section in for beavers because they have such a visible impact on the environment um, that you're going to know pretty quick if there are any nearby. Uh, but yeah, so Amir, uh, wow, well, keep mixing them up. Muskrats also create something a little similar to lodges, although on a smaller scale. They'll combine plant material along with uh, mud to create these push-ups. They also don't really prepare for the winters like beavers do. Um, so throughout the winter, they'll just eat the inside of their uh, sort of the inside of their push-up. But those are usually about three feet in height out of the water. Now there are some cases of meerkat, oh, wow, I keep mixing that up, muskrats uh, cohabitating with beavers. They will live alongside them in the beaver lodge. And in exchange for access to the food storage, they'll do uh, general maintenance, they'll do maintenance stuff. Like they'll help um, with the upkeep of the lodge. And on the left, so muskrats try to spend a lot of time in the water being that so many things like to eat them. And on account of being so small, you might have a hard time finding, uh, finding paw prints. But again, we're looking for very small um, front prints with five fingers and claws and a much larger hind foot. Um, so you thought you were going to get through a presentation about animals in New Jersey without hearing about bears and deer, uh, but you were wrong. So while these are not animals that are dependent on wetlands, they are, wow, got late. Um, they do uh, like to use wetlands for various reasons. Um, foxes, I mean, I just talked about all the tasty critters that live in them, live on these swamps and marshes. So foxes are very opportunistic hunters. They're gonna come in um, to search for food as well as uh, maybe find some nice quiet habitat. Um, this can be a problem. Uh, and there are some reports of foxes uh, just absolutely destroying, um, well, over hunting uh, endangered bird territory. So sometimes there has to be some intervention of foxes to start taking too much of an interest in nearby wetland. Um, bears aren't that big of a problem as black bears are mostly, mostly herbivorous. They're really only going to go for meat in a very opportunistic fashion, maybe if they find carrion or something. Um, but throughout the summer, they like to use wetland. They um, come in and they'll eat uh, jack in the pulpit. They like to gnaw on the, they like to dig up the tubers as well as jewelweed, there we go, jewelweed stems. Um, and also if they're having a hard time bulking up for the winter, they'll also enter the wetlands to eat mountain holly, um, which despite its name uh, enjoys acidic soil, which is one of the key characteristics of a wetland environment is to having that acidic soil. Um, deer. So deer and wetlands might sort of be an emerging learned behavior. Uh, I mean, they do provide wetlands, as I mentioned, they have that filtering capability. So they're all often a source of clean water. Um, they also like that sort of, they also provide that sort of half open, half closed territory that deer like. Um, but there are reports that there is data to back up that, um, Deer that live, deer that 
sort of hang out in swamps are less likely to get killed by human hunters because it's more difficult to get in there. So there might just sort of be this learned behavior developing where deer that stay in swamps don't get killed and survive to pass on their genes, creating this behavior. Um, so not a very pretty slide. Here are some of the swamps. If, you're, if this got you any even slightly interested, uh, here are some swamps in Sussex County. Um, I'm from there, so that's what I'm familiar with. Hopefully, most of you are from too. I'm sorry, I didn't look into any for Warren or Prosaic. But uh, we've got Hyperhumus, which is um, uh, to nearby. I think it's in Sparta. Or maybe, hmm, maybe I don't know. Uh, but there's a good trail out there, very beautiful bird watching trail. Um, Pine Swamp is in Ogdensburg. Uh, Bear Swamp is out near Branchville. And I don't know where Cedar Swamp and Longmeadow is. Um, yeah, so this ran, unless this clock I'm looking at is wrong, this ran a little late, but I am done. Uh, if you have any questions, you can 